Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. Acts 4, 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was given them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord. Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about this event. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again that you are the holy God. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to draw near to your presence today. And we pray, Lord God, that as we come near to you, may we all know you better. And may we all respond, Lord God, with reverent worship. Speak to each one of us, Lord that your glory may flow in us and through us for your own pleasure in Jesus' name. Amen. We have start, started studying about the subject of reverence. As I've said last Friday and this morning, this is the one thing that is missing in a lot of churches, in a lot of worship in a lot of ministry, in a lot of uh, believers' relationship with God. The lack of reverence. While they come to God, they do not have that reverence for God. And this word, in fact, is seldom used. Reverence. This is an obsolete word. Reverence. How often have we used that word? How often have we heard that word? Reverence. And yet, this is the distinction between somebody who come before God, who really know God and draw near to Him, and somebody who think He knows God. Because we cannot go around this subject. 
that without reverence shall fear. Without reverence, there is no way that we can know God. Now, we have just read that in the early church, revival broke out. The Lord moved powerfully by His Holy Spirit. And people were coming to the Lord. And people were beginning to know this God. And out of that, reverence flow. And when they have reverence, what followed? Like what I said this morning, that uh, just like the sons of Aaron, that as they lit their own censors using strange fire, unholy fire, unauthorized fire, they thought that any sources can do, any fire would do, as long as they have smoke coming out of their censor. And yet they were struck dead. Because they thought that as long as the action and the motion is similar to what Aaron was doing, God would accept it. Yet God was very particular about the source of power, the source of fire, the source of passion. Many people are passionate about the ministry. But they are passionate, they are burning with the wrong passion. They are burning with the wrong fire. The fire of the flesh. The fire of being recognized for their anointing, for their gifting, for their skills and their ability. The fire of wanting to, to take, hug the limelight. And this is the reason why worship has become a concert, an entertainment. And worship team would start charging, selling tickets. One time, a minister friend approached me and said, because, uh, he said, because uh, he highly respected me. So he wanted to offer me the first crack of buying a ticket in order to have breakfast with a very, very well known. Christian author. I said, no. And he was surprised. He said, people will kill for this. Bishops and all this have been calling me and I'm giving you the first choice. I said, no. He said, okay, this is what I'll do, Brother Willie. This will be my gift to you. I'll pay for it. Don't worry about it. I said, this is not about me paying money. But no. He said, okay, then at least you attend the breakfast. I said, no. He said, what's wrong with you? People would want to go, you know, to follow him. And he's here in town. And I'm letting you know. And you don't even want to go? Are you busy? I said, no. But why would the thought of paying just to meet, paying just to eat with a Christian author, I said, who does he think he is? I said, why do we do that? Oh, this is a very anointed man. I said, I know. But why do I have to pay just to meet with him? Why did he even agree to accept payment or to charge to meet with other believers? I thought, uh, the thought rep was repulsive to me. I said, don't you get it? Don't you see it? And obviously they don't. And so, most of the who is who in the church zoo were, were there. They attended that breakfast meeting. And they said, we were so blessed. And I shook my head. I remember I was praying that morning and I said, Lord, when would they learn how to revere you over man? We men are just donkeys and monkeys. Regardless of how anointed we are, we are still donkeys and monkeys. So what makes us think that we are superior, that we are Favored above others. 
That when we realize that the Lord is using us, is not that a reason to reduce us? We are so humbled to reduce us then and say, Lord, why me? Who am I? But you see, when we don't have reverence, then we begin to want to touch the glory. We begin to want to touch the gold. We begin to want to replace God. And we want to have a claim in the credit of what is going on. You know, if I pray for you, something will happen. Really. Power will flow out of my hand. Really. Is it your power? You're trying to make it sound like it's your power. And yet it's not. And unfortunately, because a lot of believers have also lost reverence for the Lord, they, this is something foreign to a lot of believers now. Reverence for the Lord. So that their standard has gone down. They are more than happy to pay for a Christian concert. They are more than happy to pay for ministry. They are more than happy to pay just to be able to shake the hand of a minister. I have well-meaning friends who have talked to me, given me advice, and, 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 and offered me help because he said, you know, you can make a lot of money. I said, I'm a minister of the gospel. He said, that is your platform. I said, no, that is my call. No, brother, really. And then they started giving me names of those people who became rich because they're anointed. They became rich because they've written books. They became rich because they spoke. I said, that doesn't. Last Sunday, was the last Sunday before I left for America. And usually, the last weekend before a long trip would always be for my family, family day. But a few days before that, in fact, that, that day I also had an important appointment. But a few days before that, I received a call inviting me to speak. And I said, ah, that's not a good time. Maybe after my trip. He said, no. We have an annual convention. And please speak. I said, so and so would want. But they said, so and so referred you to us. Why? So I talked to so and so, a pastor. And the pastor said, brother will you go? I said, they invited you, why don't you go? I don't like to go there. I've done that before. They give very little offering. I said, what has offering got to do with accepting the invitation to speak? These people have money, and yet they give you minuscule offering. That made me mad. And then the organizer called me and said, can you please come? I said, but I, you know, I was mad at my friend, but at the same time, I had other uh, appointment. But my friend, uh, this, this organizer said, please, 80% of the attendees are unbelievers. We're expecting a little over 1,000 participants. Can you please come? When I heard that, that was opportunity to preach the gospel. I said, let me make some phone calls. I, fortunately, I was able to have my uh, 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 other commitments move to next month. So I, I called back and said, okay, I'm going to go. They were delighted. They were very happy. And I was excited to be able to go. Why? Because it's a privilege to serve God. By ministering the word. I will never forget how I started. I will never forget how 
I heard the gospel. Were it not for somebody, an Indonesian Chinese, who would come all the way to Manila to preach the gospel, this Chinatown boy wouldn't even have a chance. And I said, sure. In fact, I always, every time I think about that, I get emotional because I said, Lord, who am I? I'm a below average Chinatown kid. I'm a cheap soul having been bought from an abortion clinic for 3,000 pesos. That's roughly $60. Cheaper than most of the people. Cheaper than your cell phone. And you give me the privilege and the honor to, 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 to minister your word. And you even cause doors to open. It's got to be you. With all the opportunities and the open doors, I do not forget I am still a monkey. I'm still worth that little money. And so I went. And the Lord blessed the meeting. Five, six hundred souls accepted the Lord that morning. I was so happy. Brother Willie, how much offering did you give? How little? Nada. Zero. But you know what? I didn't go there expecting that. And I rejoiced. I remember after that, I was so happy. By the way, the venue was beside in the south, in the south of... Uh, uh, what do you call that? Manila. In a place called Batangas, Talisay, Batangas. Right at the shore of Taal Volcano. And after I ministered, my wife and I were having lunch. And then there were, my wife said, did you feel it? I said, feel what? I think there's earthquake. I said, earthquake? No. She asked me three, four times or four, five times. I said, you're just hungry. Eat your food and let's go home. And then as we were leaving, there's boom. So I, we ignore that, you know. There's boom all the time in, in the Philippines because people were firing firecracker. And when my wife turned, the volcano where we took pictures few uh, earlier just erupted right before us. And my wife was shocked. Let's go, let's go. I said, no, let's go there. Let's take some more picture. And she was, no, no, you're crazy. I said, no. How often do you get to preach the gospel and watch a volcano erupt in front of you? Okay, let's perfect. So he said, no. I said, look, if you will not take picture, we're not going home. So she posted a picture with me. and I was happy pointing at the volcano. And my wife and my, my son noticed that and highlight, uh, uh, <laughs> highlighted, you know, zoomed in on her on her face and, and blew, blew it up and say, can we go now, <laughs> you know? But you see, that's the joy. You get to go places and, and as a treat, you get to witness a lot of things unusual. Last week was us fall. So when the ashes started to fall, I said, okay, let's go home. The participants who left later, two hours later, were trapped. You know, the horror of in the, when we saw the video, I said, thank God we, we left earlier. Last week was asphalt. This week was snowfall. And I'm enjoying both. Why? The Lord managed to find use for this puny chip soul. What else can I ask for? And when we always remember how we started and how we came into Christ, that reverential fear should never disappear, should never be lost, should never be forgotten. Because when we lose that, everything becomes religious. Everything you do, everything you say becomes worthless and religious. Reverence requires purity of purpose. Because of the goodness of God to the early believers, they started sharing. 
Their fire was pure because their passion was fueled by compassion. And they looked around and they said, hey, this person is in need. That person needs help. So they sold their properties to share with everybody. It's not for everyone, but everyone who had need. And it was only unlimited. They did not say, okay, that's too much, only $20. Otherwise, we won't have enough. No, they were not focused on running out. They're so full of that, and that is the wealth, the rich, riches of, of, of compassion. That No, take as much as you need. Those who don't have need, do not take advantage of that. And those who had need, took what they needed only. And as a result, there was no needy person in their midst. Barnabas, one of them, sold his property and the entire amount, proceeds of the sale, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Why? He revered God. He was thankful that he's a beneficiary of the move of God. And the only way he found that I could, the, the very limited way I could at least express my thanksgiving is, is and, 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 and my adoration for God is, I only have some property. I might as well sell them and the process just, I won't even dictate as a donor, I want this to go to that. No, no, no. I'll let the apostles decide and lay it at the apostles' feet. In other words, the apostles had the, they surrendered, they abdicated the right to decide how the money would be allocated and spent. Today, if a person would give a substantial amount to the church, they would want a say in how the pastor or the board would spend the money. Because they have other intentions. They would like, in exchange for their donation and their offering, to control how the church is run. They would like the church leadership to be beholden to them. But Barnabas' purpose was pure. He knew, I revere God, and my purpose is just to... to to, make, to share what I have. Because God in his glory shared with me, extended his love and salvation to me. And somebody saw that and said, hmm, I'm going to copy that. Look, ever since he sold his property and laid it at the apostles' feet, he has more friends. His stature among the in the community kind of went up. And so this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, thought that, hmm, that's a good formula. Then hopefully we will be elected or appointed as the leaders of the church. So they discussed and said, honey, let's just keep 20% so that we still have some money. And, and, and we'll, just, we'll just donate the rest. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But they made it appear there was deception. There was impurity in their purpose. They wanted the best of both worlds. They did not want to help the people. They, don't, they did not want to express the reverence for the Lord. What they did is they wanted to be known and they also wanted to enjoy the proceeds of the property. They wanted people to think they have sacrificed, but at the same time, they get to enjoy. And so, the husband and wife discussed and they agreed. And of course, you know the story. The husband attended the morning service, brought the offering to the apostle, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit revealed to Peter that that's an impure offering. So Peter asked him, what's this? Oh, this is the proceeds from my offering, uh, from my sales of property. Is that all? Yes, Peter. Yes, brother Peter. And of course he dropped that. 
The Lord did not kill him because he wanted all the cash. That was not. It's because of impurity. He lost the reverence. He thought that I can fool people and I can fool God. And it's okay. Just like somebody uh, once approached me and asked me to pray for him. He said, I heard that you have prayed for my friends and some of my relatives and, and, and the Lord answered their prayer. Can you please pray for me? I said, what? Um, you see, next week, we will have a record Patma, a prize for the lotto. Can you please pray that the Lord will reveal to me the number? And Brother Willie, if I win that, 50% will go to ministry. And I will guarantee 20% go to your ministry or your ministry of choice. This is when I enjoy insulting people. <laughs> That's uh, one of my pastimes, you know. So I enjoyed myself, and of course, I did not pray for him. But this is one of the extreme cases, although this is quite rampant today. Why did you pay your tithes? I'm believing God will prosper me. Yeah, the Lord said he would rebuke the devourer if you're a tither, but is that the reason why you are tithing? Why are you giving in the offering? Because I have great needs. Yes, we believe in sowing and reaping, but is that the reason why you are dropping that offering in the offering bag? Where is God in this equation? Where is God in all this action? Why are you volunteering? Oh, I made a vow to the Lord that I will volunteer for two years in exchange for the hand of that lady I was courting or whatever you're praying for. We have somehow contaminate the purpose of what we are doing in the temple of God. And if you look around, it's perfectly all right with a lot of believers. Why? Because they don't understand the concept of reverence. Many believers don't, don't see anything wrong with paying for a Christian concert. They're anointed. Probably contaminated anointing, I don't know. But when we understand reverence to the Lord, I don't care what song is sung, if they start charging money, forget it. Forget it. More than 20 years ago when Pastor Jose and I agreed that, uh, decided that we will start serving God by providing trainings and conferences, of course, that would need a lot of money. So we agreed that we will not be charging for registration fee, for materials, for food, for lodging. We will have to believe God ourselves. What if the ministry grow? Well, our faith will have to grow with it. And we will go as far as our resources, our, 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 our money, could, our finances could, could bring us. We used to say, if the, we will stop, you know, when we run out of gasoline, wherever, then the, we will stop. That means to say, okay, this is all uh, this far. We can only get this far. And we stop, and we will not feel bad. And we will, you know, we said, Lord, we've exhausted everything. It's been almost 20, well, quite some time, 20 some years. And you know what? We're growing strong. Now it's no longer just one province and one city. It's no longer just in Luzon. It's Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. It's Nepal and Hong Kong. 
I'm trying to convince him to go with me to India, Bhutan, and, and Bangladesh. Pray for him. <laughs> he said that God called you, you go. Don't, don't drag me into that. <laughs> but you see, and people could come and suggest us, you know, you can do a lot more if you charge. Well, meaning, they think of this as a business operation. I understand business. But they fail to make a distinction between the holy and the common. Like what we talked about this morning. They fail to make a distinction that this is not business. This is all about God. And showing reverence to God. Not once in 20 some years have we fought and argued over finances. Actually, we fight when it comes to pay bills. We scared the daylight out of the waitress the other day when we went to Chinatown to eat. And we're, no, no, you pay, you pay. And all the customers, they're not used to this. They're, you know, Asians do that. And they're looking at that. What are these two funny looking guys doing? And we almost got into a fist fight because we, 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 and I started, thank God, I, for Chinese, I started to speak Mandarin to the waiters. I said, don't you dare take his money. And so she took mine. Oh, that's the only time that we have any struggle over finances. <laughs> Other than that, no. We understand whether it's him paying or me paying, we have the same source. We have the same source. We do not have to have contract between us. We don't. This is all for the kingdom. Actually, we have friends who suggested that we have to, for our protection, we should have contract. I said, if we need contract, let's forget it. Let's forget it. It's always about protecting my interest or protecting your interest. Where is God in the equation? Reverence requires purity of purpose. Ananias and Sapphira lost that. Reverence required objective devotion to God. What do you mean objective devotion? If something is wrong, it is wrong. Whether it is your friend or your spouse or stranger. We usually define right and wrong depending on who is involved. If it's somebody we don't know or we don't like, if they committed some mistake or a sin, we scream at the house top. That person should be disciplined. And they probably need to be disciplined. But then, what if it happens to your closest friend or to your own son or to your own spouse? Will you scream as loud? Or you start saying, you don't understand. He's struggling. He's doing his best. You know, he's just new in the faith and trying to make excuses. I said last Friday, and this is from many actual experiences. Wives often would complain uh, with, you know, to her friends, you know, my husband is lazy. My husband is not as good as your husband. Your husband is raking in money. My husband would come home with a tiny paycheck. It's not enough for groceries and things like that. And then you always dishonor your husband in, in, in front of everybody. Belittle his, his income. Driving your husband to do some crazy things. And when your husband starting coming home and gifting you with giving you gifts of expensive jewelry, you're flattered. Honey, you shouldn't have done that. And you start complaining. You stop nagging him. Even if you know his paycheck would never be enough to buy such an expensive gift. Oh, I, that's his problem. I, I don't want to ask. I don't want to go there. We become a willing party. When our loved ones, our friends, people close to us are in sin or living a compromised life, 
if there is reverence for God, we look at sin as sin. Regardless of who is involved. We treat sin the same way. I have talked publicly about my children's failure. I thank God for great children, but they are not perfect saints. And some people actually approached me, some church leaders, and said, Brother Willie, may I suggest that uh, maybe so that you will not be discredited uh, or undermine your own credibility, maybe you, you should not use your family as an example. I disagree. The Holy God is more important. And I just want to encourage everybody that my family is not exempted from all these struggles. And how God can respond to us when we repent, when we correct and allow His grace to move in our life then people will see, this guy means what he said. If I choose not to talk about my struggles and only share about my mountaintop experiences, I actually don't have reverence for God. It's always easy to cite other people in our illustration. And use our family when it's good illustration, positive illustration. Then we have lost the objectivity. And we have, when we have lost the objectivity, we don't have reverence for God. And that is unfortunately quite rampant in the body today. Reverence requires truthfulness. Truthfulness is not convenient. Truthfulness can sometimes be very uncomfortable. Society sometimes has conditioned us to, to, to say nice things or to, to, to sugarcoat something that is not very flattering. Truthfulness is like bringing out a mirror. Am I beautiful? Why do you ask? You are a very nice person. Am I beautiful? I love your voice. Am I beautiful? You know, you are so sweet. But truthfulness is bringing out See for yourself. <laughs> May not be flattering, but that gives you real score. We can always temper it with love. Tempering it with love is very different from sugarcoating it, from diluting it. And today, Truthfulness is lacking in many preaching because they lost reverence for God. They wanted to attract crowd. They wanted the congregation to live happy. We don't want them to feel uncomfortable and squirm in the pews. Uh, the pews are new, so we don't want them to squirm there. And we try to kind of, kind of half truth and pull the punches. We are not helping people like that. Do you know that uh, if you will not be very truthful, you will be very popular? How many churches have withdrawn their invitation for me? Because they said, my preaching was hard and offensive. How many people have walked out of the service when I talk about sin? 
Do I condemn them? No. But I do condemn sin. And I come against it. When we understand reverence for God, there is no room for political correctness. Can you say amen? amen? It's kind of lame. Can you say amen? amen? Do not speak the truth apologetically. I'm sorry, but you know, why are we soft peddling that? The reason why churches right now are so caught up with political correctness is because they lost the reverence for God. And they are just playing the religious game. They try to impress people with what they do and forgetting that God is not impressed with what you bring to Him. God is looking at the heart. Something that Ananias and Sapphira learned the hard way. They wouldn't have died if they kept the money and kept the property for themselves. But because they thought they could get away, getting best of both worlds. That's what happened. Just like sometimes royalty, they enjoy the perks of royalty. But at the same time, they show contempt for the crown. They wanted to enjoy the perks of loyalty, royalty, but at the same time, they would not like to toe the line. They wanted to live life as they wish. That's an illusion. That's a deception. And if you're not careful, you'll lose both. As children of God, we are sons and daughters of God. We have privileges. We have perks as the children of God because we are sons of the King of Kings. But royalty, with all its perks, also comes with duty. But when you want heaven while enjoying hell, that's not going to happen. When you talk about going to heaven but want to be a permanent resident of the world, on earth, that's not going to happen. Christianity is the only religion that believes in heaven, but they live life as though they're not going there. They make decisions. They hoard their wealth with no intention of distributing it. We were just talking earlier uh, privately and we were reminding each other of what our spiritual father used to say. He said that if I die with a hundred dollar in my account, I have not been faithful to the cause. This is a different ball game than the world. The world says if you leave as much money behind you're good. But when we understand the richness of God and the call of God, our desire should be, Lord, let me die empty. If I die with potential still untapped, if I die with money still unspent, I have failed your call. I told my children, Aside from food and all the necessities in life, the only in, in ed, a good education, I said, don't expect me to leave behind anything for you. Everything I have would be plowed into the ministry. I leave behind to you a heritage of faith. Now you go walk with God. Have your own experiences. 
and see how God will provide you the same way He has provided for me and your mother. Thankfully, all my children agree and embrace that. And they themselves now are experiencing the faithfulness of God. <coughs> Sometimes we want to teach them to go through the motion instead of just teaching them reverence for God. When our children understand reverence, everything else will be okay. That's why yesterday, was it yesterday during the joint fellowship, I talk about, you know, how to, how to pass the heritage of faith on to the next generation. And I said the prop, and, and I shared the experience that many people asked me, you know, my children grew up in church since Sunday school, and now that they have, they're in college, and they no longer walk with God, what have we done wrong? Where have we done wrong? Why, why did we fail? Why did God allow it? I said, you know, all their lives they grew up in church. I said, that's a problem. You rest them up in church, but you fail to rest them up in Christ. You bring out your children to the church and relinquish the responsibility and pass it on to the pastor and the church. Raise my children. No, 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 no. That's not the way it should be. It is our sole responsibility as the parents to disciple our children. The role of the church and the pastor is come alongside and supplement and support you. No matter how good the church is, doing with your children, they go home and see your double life. See the compromise we have. That's what they will learn. That's what they will walk in. What we do or fail to do in private will be known in public someday. It's going to come out. It has to come out. You want to secure your children's future, make sure they have reverence for God intact. Instead of allowing them to just play the game in church, play the religious game. When they have and value reverence for God, they will be able to distinguish what are of the flesh and of the soul and what's of the spirit. What the crowd wants and enjoys, they will be turned off because they understand reverence for God. Reverence requires transparency. Transparency is not only to show your good side. Transparency just like the mirror shows you everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Transparency. You know, last a uh, uh, few days before Pastor Nationalis arrived in Nepal, my wife and I and my son, the three of us arrived earlier because my, my wife conducted a women's conference and uh, I, 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 I have to train some pastors and leaders, youth leaders and uh, there was an impromptu request for me to preach in another place, which was 10 hours driving. And you know, if you have been to Nepal, the only cars they have are toy cars. Cram, you know, uh, in the Philippines, we used to call that minika. Here a toy car, and you're stuck there for 10 hours Rough road, dusty road, and for some reason, those clowns don't even want to turn on the AC. So, you know, it's huge suffering. When I said 10 hours, I said, no. Then they said, can you please come? The Christian community would hurt that you're in, in the country. They would want, I said, maybe next time. Then the organizer said, please come. I said, it's too far. Then the organizer mentioned something that caught my attention. This is the birthplace of Buddha. When I heard that, I said, let me see my schedule. 
I was able to go there. Uh, I got, I, I preached in Kathmandu, and we left 3 o'clock. By the time I got there, it was 1.30 midnight. And then they have to talk to us. They have to give us dinner. We finished almost 3 o'clock. Call time was 7. And I preached from morning until late afternoon and have to drive back because the following day I have to fetch Pastor Jose. Otherwise, he will turn back and leave. I invited him, finally convinced him to come back again. And if I don't show up in the airport, I'm glad. So I said, no, I really have to go. After I spoke, they would not let me go, holding me. You know, I wish my wife was with me. They would say, no, if you don't want me, these people want me. Or they would, ha, you know, crying. I was already inside the car. They would open the car. I lock it. They open it and open it. They, they just, please stay. I said, I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll bring my friend back next time. Uh, but it was in that place that I saw the good and the bad. The bad was that even in the remote place like that, with very few ministers, a lot of them don't have, they already lost the reverence for God. There was a revival there over the years. And so in that birthplace of Buddha, it started with one Christian. And they tried to kill him and drag him out to be beaten. But he managed to survive. He managed to win the villagers over. He managed to pray for them and the Lord confirmed his prayer with signs and wonders. So he started to have people believing his message, accepting his gospel, and soon a church was birthed. But from one church now, there are now 25 churches there. And uh, because this, this person, the first Christian in that area, brother-in-law of Pastor Ashok, the first Christian in that area, uh, area was respected. So when he said, you know, uh, Brother Willie of the Philippines is coming, so they came. All of them there. Everybody sat on the floors except the pastors. And they all have big ribbon. Guests of honor. And all of them sit there. All the, the people sitting on the floor came with their Bibles and their notebooks, eager to learn. The pastor sat there. No Bibles, no, no notebooks. Just sit there. And then finally, the chairman of the ministerial fellowship arrived. And they pinned a ribbon. And he sat down. Then while he was talking to the other pastors, he noticed, hey, we have the same ribbon, special case of honor. So he stood up and talked to the organizer. Excuse me, I'm the chairman. How come my, the size of my ribbon is the same as theirs? It says guest of honor. I'm guest of honor. So what's the distinction? I'm the chairman. But that's all the ribbons they made. By the way, as the speaker, I did not have ribbon. So he took it off and left. He was offended. I don't try. I'm trying to be nice, okay? <clears throat> I'm nice. Uh, I hope it, it doesn't come out as bad, but yeah. For a pastor of a church with 18 members, that guy's church, his ego is huge, bigger than Buddha's belly. <coughs> and he left. That was the bad I saw. But I saw a lot of good. I saw people coming to worship. They were originally expecting 30 to 35 people. And it's a very poor province. And they ate out money and they shared just to buy enough food. And then somebody said, hey, let's exercise our faith. <coughs> we may be expecting 30 people. But let us cook food to 80 or 100 people. But nobody will come. Well, if we have so much food left after the conference, let's distribute it in the villages and share the gospel. That was a brilliant idea. 
except that <clears throat> that morning when we arrived, word spread. Almost 300 people showed up. And now they have a crisis now. They did not have enough food. And I don't think they have any money left. But they were not that pressured. Why? Well, if there's nothing to eat, there's nothing to eat. Otherwise, uh, those with food will eat less and share. So, we, you know, so that as many people can, you know, can at least get a bite. We come here for the gospel, for the word of God. That is a good eye store. They had their priorities straight. They have reverence for God. And then a miracle happened. After everybody had their unlimited lunch, some of them went for three times. Because I said, don't stop them. After everybody, 280 some people or 300 people fed, they still have a lot of leftovers. They said, how is that possible? The Lord multiplied the food. But you know what blesses me? It was clearly, even the organizer said, Brother Willie, a miracle just happened. But they did not focus on that. Up to now, they still talk about what was preached. They start talking about the presence of God during worship. Other people will highlight on the miracle of the multiplication. They talk about the message, the message, the message, the presence, the presence, the presence. That was the good I saw in the birthplace of Buddha. That most of the believers there had a very healthy reverence for God. I remember coming back. I, was, I could not sleep now because I was excited. My spirit was stirred. I was the one who left the place blessed. I said, Lord, I hope all the big churches will be like that. If it were other churches, all they talk about would be the uh, miracle of multiplication. They might change their church name. To the multiplication church. They understood the miracle was just a backdrop. What mattered most was the presence of God and the power of the Word of God. Reverence requires transparency. I saw the good and I saw the bad. And I addressed the good, and I addressed the bad. Transparency means that you see everything, and at the same time, you have the proper priority. We'll focus on the word and the power and the presence. Yeah, thank God for the food, but that's not as important. We come for the word, not for the food. Before long, they may still remember about the miracles, probably the cook and some of the leaders, but most of the people will, remember, will forget what was served that day. But hopefully, they will not forget the gospel that they heard that day. Now, I, I, I'm excited because I'm going back, hopefully with Pastor Jose, and I said, not one day now, we'll go for a week. I won't scare him, but it was fun. Uh, that place, very interesting. One of the few places that I did not open my luggage. I slept with my shoes on. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> but I left inspired. I'm actually, I, I was telling my wife, in fact, I think I told you, I said, this was a last minute thing, but that became the highlight of the whole trip. God moved mightily in our meetings in, in Kathmandu, but, but I was struck by that, what I saw. A remnant that understood reverence for God. They did not have much, but that was never a problem. When I saw how they worshipped, when I saw how they served, when I saw how they, they, they pulled from the speaker, I, 
I am blessed. The, so one of them did not even want me to sleep. I was getting irritated. Four o'clock still wanted to talk to me. I said, call time is seven o'clock. <coughs> yes, yes, it's okay. We still have three hours to go. Yeah, easy for you to say I have to speak, man. But, but uh, they're just so excited. I'll never forget that. The Lord allowed me to see the good and the bad and the ugly. And the people chose to prioritize the good. The people chose to prioritize God over the lack, over the, the, the inconvenience, over the meager surrounding. They were just blessed. And after that, they still sent me. It's been a week since you came. It's been two weeks since you came. It's been a month since you came. Meaning what? Meaning it was a new water line of experience for them. And they are craving and longing for another encounter with God. Because they understood reverence, even after the encounter, they continued to look back longingly and with gratefulness. If we miss the reverence, even when we have a great meeting, we said that was a good meeting, then move on and forget what just happened. And so I believe what they learned that day will continue to have an impact on them because they continue to treasure that. Reverence requires selflessness. In this country, one thing that is unfortunate is maybe that is a legal requirement. Maybe that is uh, a popular thing to do. But I noticed a lot of, uh, a lot of ministries, when they ask for offering and tithes, they offer two things. Online giving. Tax rebate. Or tax credit. While that may be true. But when it becomes so convenient for us, sometimes we miss, we have opportunity to miss out on reverence to God. Giving God the tithe is when we have the honor to bring before him and set Lord the tithe. Not just by one click. Sometimes we, we get, I know this is the trend. I know this is the, you know, the direction. But, but let us not forget that if we want to do that, we should do it in such a way, not at the expense of people missing out and losing that reverence for God. Even if there's tax rebate, tax exempt or tax credit, don't highlight on that too much. We don't want them to give because of that benefit. Oh, let's give. Why? Anyway, it's tax, it, it, it just write off. Instead of paying government the tax, it goes to church. Then you give with a different intent. Unfortunately, in the Philippines, they're picking up on this. They make it very convenient for people to give, and that's okay. Except that it's also very easy for them to lose that reverence. Sila, something for you to post and think about. But reverence requires selflessness. Even if it's inconvenient for you, even if it's, it's, it's costly for you, will you do it? You have heard me say that in Nepal, we had scheduled conference and suddenly there was nationwide transport strike. Instead of calling and postponing the meeting, they said, no, no, we already said it, let's go. And the people still showed up on time. Even if that meant they have to walk for seven hours. They have to walk for 40 kilometers or longer. When I was in Bhutan, a delegation from India walked for 19 hours one way. 
And when they have to leave early because my last day was Saturday and they want to be in the afternoon, they would miss the afternoon because by the time they reach there, it's almost early morning, just in time for their service. They were crying. They asked me to pray. Why? They did not want to leave. But they have to go because they have a church service the next day. They understood reverence. In the Philippines, there are many believers would not go to church because uh, there's no parking space. Because uh, it's, I think it's going to rain. We'll pass. We'll go to church next week. You think it's going to rain? This is rainy season. Are you made of salt that you will melt? So when people started telling me this, you know, uh, our church, sorry, you know, only a handful attended because, uh, you know, I, I don't say anything. Why? Obviously, they don't understand reverence. So why argue? Why scold them? I said, okay, no problem. Because those who showed up, hopefully, understood that. And I would minister, whether it's a handful, a room full, or an overflow crowd. Why? I'm doing it. This donkey is just saying what God wants him to say. The intensity of our ministry should have nothing to do with the size of the crowd, the size of the offering. When we understand reverence for God. One well-known pastor went to, a, went to Hong Kong to preach. He rented a big place. When he arrived, he was about to preach. He and his guests from America, they saw that only 17 people showed up. They traveled there just for that conference. When he saw just a handful of people showed up in a big auditorium, he turned to his assistants and said, take over, we're going shopping. And they went shopping. Why? They looked at the size of the crowd. They forgot that even if there's one person, God is there. Because they lost reverence for God. Brothers and sisters, your intensity of devotion to God should have nothing to do with the popularity, with more people doing that or less people doing it, and nobody doing what you're doing. When we understand reverence, doing the right thing is always the right thing, regardless of how popular or unpopular it is, whether it's convenient or inconvenient. That's a cry of my heart. One time my son was very concerned and said, Dad, are you all right? I said, why? Oh, so how many churches does cancel out on you because they were offended by your message? I said, you know what, son? I don't care. I actually thank God for saving me some time and sparing me from them. I don't go because they love me. I don't do that. Oh, you'll never be big. Who cares? I'm already doing more than 3,000 pesos worth. I've already lived more days than what I was supposed to live, which is to die before I was supposed to be born. What more can I ask? What more can I ask? What more can you ask? The reason why I sharing, I'm sharing this with, with you and not with just a leadership meeting is the reverence for God is for every believer. It is when we have that reverence for God that the world will revere our God. When they don't see that in our walk with God, don't expect them to want to believe your message and receive your message. More than the facilities, the trappings, the technology, the skill levels, the, uh, the, the, the publicity. What makes ministry last? 
what causes the seed we sow to reap a bountiful harvest of souls is when we keep that one thing, reverence for God, intact. Lastly, reverence requires absolute trust. Not partial, not delayed, not conditional. Absolute trust. What if, what if they react negatively? What if they withdrew their support? What if they, 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 they what if, so what? When we read the Bibles, you will see the men of God are not the popular ones. You have the group, the school of prophets that eat off the king's table. And you have that one prophet. Elijah was called by Ahab, the troublemaker of Israel. Elisha was living far from the palace. Very remote. Micaiah, the king did not have anything good to say about him. And really, he was always the last choice. Had it not been for Jehoshaphat who said, no, no, call him. He does not belong. He has no membership in the prophets, among the prophets. His name is not in the in directory of the prophets. But he is the only member of an association called the prophet of the living God. That's Micaiah. All throughout the Bible, you will see those who walk with God walk a lonely path. But when you understand reverence, you won't feel lonely. When you understand reverence, you don't mind. You are so focused on the presence of God. All these things don't have any bearing on us. We're living at a time when all of us need to go back and make sure we have. If you have lost it, get back that reverence for God. I remember in 2001, December, that was just a few months after 911. That was the first time I came to America. To preach central I was excited I love it here then I went to Portland Oregon I love it that's for me the most beautiful place but now I will not even set foot there my, my relatives there, come, will you don't come? It's been how many years? Seven years, eight years? I said, uh-uh. Uh -uh. I used to, my last stop always L.A. Because there's a ramen shop I like. But of course, actually, because I get to go to Azusa Street and pray. And Bonnie Bray House to pray. I don't go there for a few years now. If there's anything I want, like kimono, I'll just contact my friend there and say, ship it here. Because I collect kimono, the real one. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> Every time my new kimono arrives, we'll ask either Pastor Jose or Pastor Jin Ho to bring. And my opening line is always telling my wife, guess what? Or you're not going to believe this. Now, my wife is so sharp now. When I said guess, what? <laughs> she knows already I'm up to something. But you know, I, I don't go there anymore. And honestly, for what, the past six, seven years already, I have to drag myself coming to America. Not because of your pastor. In fact, he's the reason why I have to drag myself. Uh, uh, I do not enjoy coming here. It hurts me. When I see the drastic deterioration in this nation, when I see the corruption in many churches, 
when I see the corruption and the compromise of many ministers, it breaks my heart. And I don't like But I still come. I don't enjoy it, really. I enjoy the hospitality of your church, of your pastor's family, and of friends. But other than that, because I always go home with a heavy heart. Because what I see here, I understand the relationship between my country and this country. And I go back and always, I always think, what I see here will eventually reach the Philippine shore. When I'm here, I cry more in my prayer. And I plead for God to please have mercy. And this year I come with the plea, with believers, please. I'm not asking you to say, you know, witness more. Give more. Pray more. I come here with one plea. Make sure. Your reverence for God is intact. You can do more, but if you lose that reverence for God, churches are losing their grip. The soul of this nation is at stake now. As somebody who comes once a year regularly in January, one week before Martin Luther King's Day, I come here like clockwork. So I get to have a snapshot every year. And so accurately, the same season, the same you know, place, the same color, I can see the deterioration. It, it is very scary. I pray for America more than other countries because of the mantle of, of the influence of this nation upon the world. You live here. You built your homes here. You built your enterprises here. Do not be so preoccupied with enjoying life that we, you are oblivious to what is going to happen. <coughs> you are here either by birth or by migration for a purpose. I said earlier, that reverence requires purity of purpose. So you want to come here. You want to be an American citizen. <coughs> Do you treat this as your country? Aside from criticizing the corrupt government officials, do you fast and pray for this country? Do you pray for the churches of this nation? I do. <coughs> my family joined me in my fast for this nation. I don't intend to apply for green card. I don't like to live here. Just to visit friends, yes. But I, I don't see myself living here. A few years ago, a Chinese church in Vancouver offered me to be a pastor. They would arrange everything. My whole family will go there with a good salary, one free car, one house. I said, no. <coughs> he said, you are needed here. You speak Fukien, Mandarin, Chinese, English, Tagalog, and other languages. You need it here. The church will grow. I said, that's not for me. And they said, don't you know that people want to come? I said, that's not for me. I know where God wants me to be back in the Philippines. I will be traveling, but my base will be in the Philippines un unless God says so. And they double. Two houses, two cars. And they jack up. Canadian dollar. Six digit. And I said, no. And they, they got insulted. Okay, name your price. They thought that I wanted more. I said, you don't get me, do you? It's never about money. It's never about money. Well, can you at least recommend somebody? I said, I don't know. 
and I don't want to recommend somebody. If that, that is how you look for a pastor, using money to, to, to entice them. So I turned them down. And they have friends in Manila that say, you, know, you want to reconsider, you know, this is a rare once in a lifetime. I said, you don't understand. You don't understand. So, I have no intention for leaving here, moving here, or applying for green card. But I fast and pray for this nation. I cry out for this nation. What about you? What about you? Who call America home? Unless we have that reverence for God, America will not revere our God. Let's pray.